You are listening to Setting History Straight with Linda Watson on Hebrew Nation Radio. Welcome to our show, and we have Joey with us today. Hello. You, and so we're going to be covering some of the current events today, correct? Because there's so much going on in the world that I, I don't think we could cover anything else except prophecy right now. It's just amazing what's playing out in this world and in this country. God has just speeded things up, hadn't he? He sure has. And so I thought we would start, and I think Amos 6, verse 10, and it says, And a man's uncle shall take him up, and he that burneth him to bring his bones out of the house, and shall say unto him that is by the side of the house, Is there any with thee? And he says, Shall say no. Then he shall say, Hold thy tongue, for we shall not make mention of the name of the Lord. Is that not exactly what's going on in this country? Nobody wants to talk about the church. Nobody wants to talk about their faith. People think it's embarrassing to talk about religion. Well, Linda, you've also got to consider the fact that there's going to come a time when he asks us to go into our closet and be quiet. So, you know, this this could have a double meaning as well. Absolutely. But I think it's so significant that we see this verse and it's telling you that even when somebody dies in your house don't even talk about them at the funeral don't don't bring god up don't talk about god in your land we don't we just don't talk about god it's just not a polite thing to do it's not what they call politically correct is it nobody wants to talk about god and so this is where we've come in our land this is where we've come and joy is absolutely right there's going to be a time that we need to hold our tongue because it, our life may depend upon it. That's so correct. If, while we're here in Amos, let's talk about Amos 7 and verse 7 and 8. Can you read that for us, Joey? 7 and 8. Thus he showed me, behold, the Eternal stood on a wall made with a plumb line and with a plumb line in his hand. Notice the wall is made with the plumb line and he holds the plumb line. And the Eternal said unto me, said unto me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. And then the Eternal said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not pass by them any more. I want to read verse 9 as well because that kind of continues the thought. It says, The high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. Now, Linda, you may have a different take on this, but uh, the way I see this is um, that this is a calendar statement. And, you know, today the religions, Christianity, and I, I use the term religions of Christianity because there's so many various sects, but they all have one, in com one thing in common, and that is they hold to the calendar that is of Pope Gregory, that is the accoutrements of the Catholic Church. Uh, whether they say they come out of them or not is irrelevant because their actions indeed say that they do not. Um, when it brings up the house of Jeroboam, it is speaking strictly of how Jeroboam left or separated himself with the success of King David's house, which is the house of Judah. Back in, you can read the story in Second Chronicles, Chronicles, the 11th chapter, where Jeroboam stepped out and, and changed the calendar, kept the Feast of Tabernacles in the eighth month when he established his own priest apart from that of Levi and basically changed. He was the first that began the process of changing times and laws for the house of Israel after King David. And so this plumb line that is being set up or that's being questioned, in my opinion, the plumb line is that of the keeping of time. And of course, our father's covenant law is established on the keeping of time. And a lot of people miss that, especially those in the Christian faith. Right. I'd and I also see that there's a plumb line already drawn in this country between the the people that we call the liberals and the people that are called the conservatives. And I think it's very interesting that who is feeding this this division and the, the people that are feeding this division is the news media. There's Our no country doubt. is divided in half. And when we look at the differences between the two of us, there is some differences, right? But That's correct. The news media have made it their job to continue to stir up this this conflict that's going on between the liberals and the conservatives. And I think this is what God is using Trump for, 
to draw attention to the news media because they're so corrupt and they're destroying that's, our country. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. And, um, you know, there's a battle going on that's that's a, above and beyond the physical things that we see on CNN and Fox and MSNBC uh, that, that you will not be told. And that story is told in the pages of the scripture. Um, that's, you know, we, we could read in Daniel, the, the, 12th chapter about a man by the name of Michael standing up for his people. You can read about the fact that <clears throat> this news media is basically falsifying what's truly going on. They're, they're shutting their ears. They are not speaking the truth. And you're right, Linda, that goes back to what's being said here. And when he says he will not pass by them anymore, there's this wink, wink that's going on that out of his grace, he has he has allowed for so many years, and there comes a time when that line is drawn in the sand, and he says no more. That's exactly right. And that's why they are fighting him tooth and nail, and because they know that they are under attack for the first time in their, in their history. They've been allowed to say what they want, and they think of themselves as the final authorities. Do they not? Right. Yeah, you know, They least... set themselves up as our teachers and our standards for right and wrong. Right. In this country. And that is what is trying to be destroyed right now by your Heavenly Father. He's had enough of this. So we know that the end result, right? But it's things are moving so quickly in history and they're moving so quickly in our in our lives right now with so many events coming to fruition. You know, they chose the high priest, right, um, in Jerusalem. So. So many things are coming to pass and so many prophecies are coming to pass, are they not, Joey? That when do people need to look and know when this country is going to go under? And, and scripture kind of tells you a little bit of that, doesn't it? Um, let's just flip over one more page and talk about Amos 2, uh, Amos 8, verse 2. I'm going to read this one, Joey. Uh, actually, I'll start in verse 1, and it says, Thus said the Lord, Show unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said to Amos, Now, by the way, Amos was the only prophet that wasn't a Levite. Every one of the other prophets were Levites. And he was actually the very first prophet out of all of these, uh, all these books. His book was written first. He was the one called first. And it must have been a scary thing for him because he told God, Look, I'm, I'm just a sycamore former i'm not a levite so why are you sending me to the king to tell him this and obviously this prophecy was for his time it was for israel then but it, it's dual isn't it and it's also for us today but it tells you that they would fall during the basket of summer fruit and it said and he said and amos said what seeth thou and i said a basket of summer fruit Thus said the Lord unto me, the end shall come upon my people of Israel, and I will not again pass by them any more. This is a prophecy for our time. He did give them another chance, didn't he? After that first fall. That's not right. talking about the first fall. It's talking about the second fall, is it not? And he says right. you're going to fall in the summertime. Right. And, uh, you know, Linda, you and I both learned under the same preacher. And uh, I won't mention his, his name, but, but that, that evangelist that you and I both know very well, he taught us um, one of the, the true gifts of understanding prophecy, and that is to always recognize the time setting that's being spoken of. Now, I, I really do not think that he fully understood the calendar aspects of it. But, you know, just to, to very quickly point out something I've pointed out in your program before, and that is that a year is a type of a day and a day is a type of a year. And that is to say that a day, we would all recognize the points of interest or the high points in a day. And they are dawn, sunrise, noon, sunset, dusk, and midnight, and then finally Absolutely. dawn again. The year has the exact same points of interest. There is the dawn of the year, which is the moment in time on the uh, latitude that is Jerusalem all the way around the world, which, by the way, passes right through your neck of the woods, Linda. That is South Georgia, South Alabama, South Mississippi, through Louisiana and Texas. That line is a parallel all the way around the earth that, that Yahweh bases his feast upon. And that's, that's found in Isaiah 
33, verse 20. If someone wants to go and look that up. But from that line on February 21st, light overcomes darkness for the first time in the year. So that we say that in February 21st is the dawn of the year. And then on March 21st, the, uh, the sun rises over the equator. We call that the vernal or spring equinox. That's the sunrise of the year. When the sun rises from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere, the summer solstice is the noon time of the day, and the sunset is the the fall equinox, which is September 23rd, and finally the 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 dusk of the year when light overtakes darkness by one minute in the day. That is October 23rd, and then finally the winter solstice is December 23rd, the shortest day of the year when the sun is at its its weakest point, and and that we would call that the midnight of the year, and then finally it starts all over again. So this. This period, this time setting you're talking about here of summer wheat would be the period sometime um, in the summertime or the, the period from June, July, and August, somewhere in that vicinity. Yes, it would. And I think it goes further into Jeremiah 6 when it says the armies come ar- uh, upon you at yes, noon. That's correct. Well, it says the the evening shadows are drawing long. Let us come up at night. So the war that's coming against America may have been planned or set to be in motion in daylight or the afternoon hours of the year, which would be July and August and and, uh, September. But that actual war that's coming upon them would be in the winter months or the nighttime portion of the months because he says – That's exactly right. Let us go up to battle against them at night. Right. That's – so it's it's starting – I'm looking at this as – the uh, almost lasting a whole year, right? And so that when you look at that, you're you're thinking because he's talking to you that it says in Hosea it talks about it will take one moon to uh, and a moon can represent a month we know that but it also can represent a year can it not? That's correct. So it's talking in Hosea that there will be it, Israel will go under in one moon. Now it's possible that it could go under a, in one month, but it also could mean that it's going to, going to go under in one year because it keeps talking about a two-year period of, of captivity when you get to the book of Hosea. Right. Go ahead. Linda, I wanted to, to bring up the, uh, something that I've been studying very closely in the past couple of days, and that is the sign that is given in Revelation 12, verses 1, actually 1 through 3. Um, and that is the sign that says, uh, verse 1 says, Now a great sign appeared in the heavens, and a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and on her head tw- a garland of twelve stars. And then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Now, anybody who's listening to your program has read that passage, but uh, a, a lot of the people who are listening may want to stop this recording if they're listening to it as a recording. And just Google September 23rd, uh, 2017, the sign of Revelation 12. There's a, a series of videos that is done by a gentleman, and I, I, I do not know his name. He sounds like he has an Australian accent, and he basically shows, uh, makes the case very well, by the way, very, very good presentation about how Jupiter um, goes into the belly or the womb, if you will, of the Virgin beginning in November of 2016. The date is uh, somewhere around the 20th of November, 2016. And through the... Right after the election, right? Right after the election. And I'm going to come to that in just a minute. Um, and what occurs is that that heavenly body of Jupiter, which, by the way, is the king. It is the king planet. planet. And that body stays in the womb of the virgin for exactly uh, 42 weeks, which is, uh, of course, nine months and, and actually two extra months, if I'm not mistaken. Two so, extra weeks. Two yeah. extra weeks. So, And that is, of course, the, the furthest amount of gestation that a woman would have, somewhere between 38 and 42 months. That gestation period, which represents the 42 weeks, also represents the 42 months she's in tribulation. That's three and a half years. So, and then finally, that planet exits the womb as in a birth, like giving child here, and it it does so on the night 
of September. Now, the video is of the 23rd of September, which would be Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, exactly one year from now. But that planet is still between the legs in that date, and I think that's the case that they're making, that that period of time is the period that it's being born and cleaned up and whatnot. Now, a lot of people may have seen that video, but I don't think that they have equated that passage in Revelation 12 to what is said both in Daniel, the 12th chapter, where there is a time of trouble like has never been before, and what occurs to cause that to take place. Now, you mentioned the election, Linda, but the second half of that passage, and I'm speaking specifically Daniel 12, verse 1, says, And there shall be at that time a time of trouble such as as never was since there was a nation, even until that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, every one that is found written in the book. And it goes on to say, many, verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And we know that that's the time period of the, the resurrection, both of the saints and of the house of Israel. But uh, the, the question is, what causes such a time of trouble, and is that the same period as the gestation period, the 42 weeks in which the woman is impregnated and finally gives birth, and what exactly, Linda, is she giving birth to? That's the question that I would like to try and attempt to answer here, and, and I'd like your thoughts on it. What are your thoughts before I go into this? Well, I... I think she's the remnant, she's the outcast, and she could be the uh, people that's in the churches. We do know that in the book of Revelations, it says the woman goes into the wilderness, the dragon comes after her, and her he can't overcome the woman, so he goes after her seed who are keeping the commandments, which would be, this is this would be the people who are keeping the Sabbath, the holy days, and it says they have the testimony of uh, of Jesus, of the Messiah. So what he's saying here is some of those people, the dragon is going to turn around and go after, are believers. Well, Linda, you They're opened the program. They're not taken into the wilderness. You opened not the all program. of them. Right, right. Um, you opened the program by saying that, you know, it's it's in, it's politically incorrect to talk about religion and I wanted to add politics because the two go hand in hand. You, you really can't speak correctly to one without speaking about the other. And those are the two things that society tell you that you can't talk about. This is a religious subject that ties directly to the politics of the coming government or the kingdom of, of the Most High. So that said, I want to read specifically the passage that, that you just quoted, which is Revelation 12, verse 17. And there's something here that in discussing this with, with my wife yesterday, we or I got it through my thick skull that there that something I have missed, and it is this. It's the past the, the verse says this. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Christ. The key phrase that I had missed is the rest of her offspring. Right. Now this is the same woman, the virgin, right? Is it? Is that what it says? It does well, it not does, call her a virgin. But it, no, it does. Doesn't. It does refer to her as the virgin in Isaiah fifty-six, where it talks about this barren woman okay, who that, will have children. Hold that thought for just a minute, because this is where I want to head. This woman we've equated to as a virgin, and the the woman in the stars is equated to as a virgin, right? Where Jupiter right. goes into that belly of that womb. Okay. And I'm making the case that this is not Mary birthing Christ as the church has taught us. It, right. First of all, it, does, it doesn't make any sense. What is being birthed here is something completely different. It is a government. And the rest of her offspring are children that she had before she had this child in verse 1. And the reason that these people are being persecuted is because they are a part of the church. And that... Revelation 2 and Revelation 3 teach us unequivocally that we are to overcome the church and literally come out of the church 
so that we can listen to the good shepherd, which is John 9, John 10, the story of the, the blind man that was given sight by Yeshua. And now in chapter 10 of John, he can listen to the voice clearly without the static, if you will, of the false doctrines of the church. Because seven times in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3, we are told we must come out of the church. We must overcome the, the things that the churches have for us. Absolutely. That <laughs> so I, means all of the, the organized religions. It, that's it, correct. It, I'm not saying that you can't go to these, these churches and fellowship. I'm really saying that where do you take your, your walk? I mean, do you let organized churches and religions dictate to you how what you believe? That's what we're talking about here. Yeah, you, you've got to almost become, there's no other way to say it. You've got to be out on an island by yourself and Christ. There's no other way to say it. And when, when you attend these churches, you are putting a mediator between you and the Father, and that mediator is not Christ, it's your pastor. And I, I don't care how lovely and sweet you think your pastor is, I can promise you unequivocally you're being taught false doctrine. I can promise you that. And I have not seen one organization that has all of the truth, and I haven't seen one that has a lot of it. I'll right. just say that. <laughs> and so what has happened is we have just immediately think that we have have the truth and the knowledge, but there's some there's some teachings that are going on that needs to stop. Okay, Linda, I want to take – I've just set the stage for where I'd like to go, and that is Isaiah, the seventh chapter. Okay. Because – I think we have missed the boat in understanding what's being said here. It's just like the promised land, Linda, right? When we read Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter, and we read about the promised land and the children of Israel crossed over the, the uh, river of Jordan into what would now be today modern-day state of Israel in the Middle East, that that was simply a stopping point, if you will. The exact same thing, Linda, is taking place here. In Isaiah 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. And so I'm speaking specifically. I'll start in verse 14. You just can't make the case that Isaiah 7, 1 through 13 occurred during the time that Christ was being birthed. It, you just can't make it fit. History doesn't fit. But you can make the case that it is happening right now. Now, I want to read verse 14 to begin with, and then we'll talk about it. It says, Therefore, the eternal or the Lord himself will give you a sign. Now, I make the case that that is the same sign that is in Revelation, the 12th chapter, verse 1. Behold, yes. Behold a virgin, and, and that word is not virgin like we would think of as a woman who has never given birth. This is a, the word is Alma in Hebrew, and it's not always a virgin. It can mean a young maiden, okay, someone who has actually given birth. But a young maiden shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name God with us, Emmanuel. That's the way it's translated. Now, so this is a verse that can actually have a dual meaning, can it not? Absolutely. And it's like any dual meaning or any prophecy. It has a partial fulfillment, and that would be the birth of Christ. And it has an end time or a fullness of its fulfillment um, in prophecy at the end time. Now, isn't it interesting that he says, I'm going to give you a sign? That's right. And is that not what's going on, going to go on and play out in Revelations 12? That's correct. Now, he goes on in verse 15 to bring up something that, that uh, I could make the case ties to the promised land. But basically, when you read curds and honey at the beginning of verse 15, you can read milk and honey, as in the land of flowing with milk and honey. But it does occur in this nation to the abundance of, if Abraham could, could walk into walked into America and saw the countless amounts of milk and honey on our food shelf today. Well, it's but obvious that this is a, another example of happening part in Israel, but it's definitely happening in our country today. Absolutely, no doubt. Now, curds and honey refers back to the law. It is the land flowing with milk and honey is not talking about literal milk and honey on our store shelves. Although that's a typology, it's talking about when his law will flow, the fullness of his law will flow, and, and everyone will know it. That's the coming government. Curds and honey he shall eat, in other words, he shall know the law. 
and that he may know to refuse evil and choose good. For before the child shall know to refuse evil and choose good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both of her kings. Both of her kings. What did we talk about? You brought it up just a minute ago about the political system where we have two parties, if you will, two kings that are working against one another for power in this land. There's coming a time when that land, that party system will be forsaken by both kings. And the eternal, verse 17, will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. Now that is a direct reference to the time of King David, the time when the the plumb line was set up with Jeroboam, the time when the house of Israel was split and is even split today in this land of America. And as this country still being divided into the king of the north and the king of the south, just as it was after the days of David and Solomon when Jeroboam and Rehoboam absolutely split. see that and that's why we had the civil war it was and it's yep. been played out and it's still playing out and, and, folks, we, if and you're now not, it's just different names you're calling it the king of the north and the king of the south you're calling it the liberals the conservatives you're calling it the north and the south it's basically that division that's between correct. two different groups of people and who feeds it the news media they're the yep. ones that are stirring it up but I think that's what you're bringing up is really, really interesting. But I also want to make reference of Romans 11 because I think that's a critical piece that we're living at. We're living this verse, and we don't even know that we're living it because we've been taught it incorrectly. And yep. it says, verse 25, this is Romans 11, verse 25, I would not have you, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Now, I'm telling you that we are living in the time of the Gentiles. They are rising as we speak. And you read Jeremiah 9, verse 9, it tells you that the circumcised will be the, will be taken down by the uncircumcised, and that's exactly what we see. And that's what we're, li- we're living through. And he tells you that Israel's eyes are going to be open during the time of the fullness of the Gentiles. That is a prophecy. So go, without go a ahead, doubt, go ahead, Joey. I'm sorry. I just when you started talking about that, I said I had to bring it up because they have not taught that properly. Agree. And I wanted to, but continuing on in uh, Isaiah seven. In verse 18, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Eternal will whistle for a fly, for the fly that is in the furthest parts of the rivers of Egypt, and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. Now, these two individuals, if you will, and they're not individuals, they're people, he is going to use them to chastise or to punish Israel. And I'll tell you who they are. The fly that comes from the rivers of Egypt, the Hispanics, the Central Americans, the uh, the the Moors are a combination of in history and Linda you have taught this the Moors and the Egyptians the Moabites and the Egyptians which conquered Spain and have come here they are the, the consuming locust that Joel speaks about in Joel the first chapter and then the bee that is from the land of Assyria is the nation of Russia and that's anybody so you are absolutely any, right. Because that's where Ezekiel 38 yep. comes in, and it says she yep. he comes, Gog, and comes against the cities of Israel when they are at peace that's in right. unwalled cities. You got it. And these two entities, one from the north and one from the south, is, is what we're seeing. They are, as Joel speaks about in Joel, the first chapter, they are the locust that consumes everything we have. And it says in Ezekiel 38 that the king of Assyria comes in to take cattle and goods. And exactly. And so that's what we're talking about here. You know, God uses these symbols to represent these people. And, it, and it's not the only symbols that there's all kinds of symbols in the Bible that represent different groups, does he not? We just need to read right. between the lines. Who's right. destroying our country? Our resources are being eat up by the aliens that are in a country. That's just a fact. And other other scriptures calls the king of Assyria the work of his hands. That means that 
that he is going to use the king of Assyria to chastise, just like a, a parent would spank his young child when he has done wrong. That's what's happening. Do Anybody who is studying scripture and, and is not watching Vladimir Putin needs to have their eyes open. You need to start watching Vladimir Putin. Because they are the work of the righteous creator and king. He is the one that is pulling these strings and putting these pieces of the puzzle together. Yes, and absolutely right. And there's also a man named Dugan who yes. is driving. He's the advisor to Putin, and he is yep. a priest in the Greek Orthodox Church. He is, he is correct. absolutely driving this, and he's said many times, we're going to revive the Holy Roman Empire. And their plan is to take Turkey, Iran, and Central Europe. And eventually you know that when you read Ezekiel 38, it comes against the unwalled cities. Well, the unwalled cities can't be Jerusalem. They nope. have to be our land. We are that land. Gog and Magog takes a large contingency of confederacy with them when they come against the uh, the land of Israel. It takes a large contingency. It's a lot of people. So they're going to be like a cloud in our land. It's going to be so many. Linda, I want to get to Isaiah 8, if, if nothing else. And I want to get to 9, 10, and finally 11, because 11 is really the culmination of this prophecy um, when you know, Yeshua sets his hand a second time to recover the remnant of the house of Israel. But chapter 8 is, in my opinion, is a repeating of this exact same scenario that we found in chapter 7. Except this time, it's not speaking of the female child. It's speaking of the male's child. Specifically, this is Isaiah's child. In verse 1, it says... And, and, Chapter 8, verse 1 says, Moreover, the Eternal said unto me, Take a large scroll and write on it with a man's pen concerning, and this is quite a name, Maher Shalahau has Baz. <laughs> and literally what that, what that means is speed the spoil and hasten the booty. Speed the spoil and hasten the booty. And I will take for myself faithful witness, witnesses to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Shebertiah. Verse 3. Then I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. And the Eternal uh, said to me, Call his name Maher Shalahazvaz. For before the child, notice this time setting, Linda, again, you've got to know the time setting. Before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother, and that's a period of what? About a year. A, a child that's a year old will begin to say mama, dada, right? Yes, one or two years. Right. Okay, before that period occurs, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be taken away before the king of Assyria. Now, this is the reason this video that gives the time setting of the conception occurring in the middle of November and the birth occurring nine months later, basically, in September of 2017 is so important because if that child that's being spoken of in Revelation, the 12th chapter, is this exact same child being spoken of here in Isaiah 7 and 8, then we're looking at the period of the king of Assyria coming into the land and taking the spoil and destroying it literally in America's eyes as being the period of September before September 2018. And that that comes into play because of the passage you brought up in Jeremiah, the sixth chapter, which said, let us make war against the virgin daughter of Zion. Let us come and make war against her, but the evening shadows are growing long. Let's wait until it begins to grow dark and night falls. That's when you're going to we're going to come up and make war against her. So what what these passages are doing is giving us the time setting according to the sign of revelation the 12th chapter if all of those pieces of the puzzle fit together then you know we can know these things. We we can see them coming about and this election I talked about just a minute ago Linda about what would set in motion a pregnancy a time of trouble. You know, 
a woman that's that's just become pregnant for no reason. She doesn't understand. Even before she really knows she's pregnant, she begins to have morning sickness. She begins to have a time of trouble that she's never experienced before. And so, and that gets worse and worse and worse as it goes along. Um, I have a feeling that this this child that's being born is the birth pains of the government of Yahweh and all that goes with it. And it could be a very, very, very rough time in the nation of end time Israel, the United States of America in the coming Absolutely. years. Absolutely. And so if you look at Isaiah 9, verse 6, and you may be about to go there, it says, And that child uh, unto us a son is given, and a government, government shall be on his shoulders. And Linda, you know, that passage is, is read, I guess, every Christmas time. But those of us who know the truth and keep the Feast of Tabernacles, we, many of us that know the truth, actually celebrate the birth of Christ and we go to this passage and we read it during the feast because we we know the time that we're celebrating is when he was born but even Christ's life even his birth his life his burial and his resurrection is a typology of the coming government on this earth and that is the government of Yahweh the most high this is a pretty powerful statement when he says he's coming to bring a government and the absolutely. government should be upon his shoulders. Yeah, absolutely. So does everyone see that what's being played out here is a is another symbolism that's being played out? Every scripture and every verse has a second meaning, does it not? And so this is being played out again. It's been in, played in out again in a different way, but it's being played out again. The churches would never teach this, and they would never see it. They, I mean, they they get in their little box, and they want to teach their their doctrines, and they they do not want people to think outside that box. And that's where the truth lies. That's where the depths of of scripture and the depths of understanding lie is outside of your church organization. I, there's no problem going to church there, but you've got to begin to think outside of what they're teaching you in the church. And it wasn't until Maria and I left these organizations that we finally begin to glean things from Scripture. And I know you, Linda, are the same way. I've known you for a very long time, and you have grown exponentially because you've left the church. I can't say it, I can't say it any better. You do exactly what Ruth did. The laborers were in the field. That was the false That's laborers, right? The false laborers were in the field. But what did Ruth do? She gleamed along the edge, and that's what we got to do. We got to pick the truth wherever it is. Linda, we don't attach ourselves to an organization, and we don't just accept everything that they teach, especially when they brought in things that they can't find in Scripture. But you know, Linda, throughout all of this, throughout um, Isaiah seven, Isaiah eight, especially in nine, where it starts talking about the calamities that will come upon Israel. This phrase continually comes up time and time again. This is Isaiah 9, verse 12. At the end of the verse, it says, For all of this, his, Yahweh's anger, is not turned away. His hand is still stretched out. His, his hand is stretched out still. In other words, return to me. Return to me. He says it again in verse 17, the end of that verse. For all of this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. It's like the curses of, of Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 where he says, I, I bring a curse upon you, and if you will not turn to me, if you will not repent and recognize what is happening and change and amend your ways and take hold of my covenant, then I will bring seven times more the curses upon you. He says it again at the end of verse 21. For all of this, his anger is not yet turned away, and his hand is still stretched out. Come, return to me. Chapter 10, verse 4, for all of this, his anger is not turned away. You need to be reading in your studies. We don't have time to go through this in depth. But these, between these passages where he says, for his anger is still not turned away, there is curse after curse after curse of desolation that's coming upon this land. And so this theme of trying to get Israel to repent, even in the very last wait, waning hours, is evident in scripture his mercy is there if we will just repent absolutely and this 
and everyone says, well, I can't do anything. I'm not a prophet. I can't, I can't show people what's coming on them. Well, everybody has Facebook. And what does it Absolutely. take to put yeah. a little remark out there every once in a while telling people, if nothing else, put some scriptures out there for them to read? It, it, That's right. You know, it, we can all do our part, can we not? And if everybody in the in the that's a believer just went out to Facebook and posted a you know a few um, remarks and a few scriptures, that goes a long way because that's right. maybe people and, will think about that. And I, I hate to keep harping on the church, but Linda, that's that's where people can do the the in my opinion the greatest work is to start making people think. You know, if you if you go to church and you're You've gleaned all you can glean from the pastor or the minister. Why don't you start teaching him? <laughs> I mean, we used to just ask the question, you know, uh, our minister loved to go out and eat into the uh, on the Sabbath day to Ryan's and Golden Corral and places, and he'd have the, basically the whole congregation that wanted to go with him, and they would have fellowship there. And it was a great time. I mean, we really enjoyed it. But there come a point to where we started asking, you know, Hang on a minute. The scripture says you're not supposed to buy and sell on the Sabbath day. And when we started doing that, we become ostracized, but we made people think in the process. And so that's the way Yahweh works. He tears down so that he can build back up in the proper way. He has to and tear down the foundation, the wrong foundation, and put a new foundation in there. And that's what I see that he's doing. And yeah. it, it, it's becoming very obvious at this point. Without a doubt. Well, it, there's a lot more that I wanted to go through, but I don't think we have the time. So I'm... These signs in the heavens, that's not the only sign that's going to occur. Because if you read Revelations 12, it says there's another sign in the heaven. And it's that yep. it is the uh, red dragon, yep. which has seven heads. And, and it says... Uh, and one of those heads is wounded. That is the actual story of the Hydra in Greek mythology. It was Hercules came and cut off one of the heads and two heads come back, which is exactly what prophecy says will happen. Basically telling you the story of the Hydra, which is in Greek mythology. So all these years, people have thought Greek mythology, that's all paganism. No, those stories have been around for thousands of years and they, are That's actually right. now being coming to fruition, and they're coming. We're beginning to see that some of the Greek mythology is playing out in the heavens. And I, you know, they made the mistake That's of right. worshiping these people, right? But the whole point was the stories were accurate, and they were going to tell the story at the end time. Well, how in the world would that happen unless your heavenly Father many years ago told them these stories, and they have kept faithfully those stories throughout the centuries? For this time. And now these stories are being played out in the heavens. Yeah. I mean, Yahweh said he would do nothing without a witness. Well, that's a witness to all people. And some people get the story from the pages of the scripture. Other people get the story from, like you're saying, mythology. There's the story is being told in the movies. Anybody who, who doesn't believe or doesn't isn't able to see the scriptural story in some of the movies of the day really you've got your head in the sand and you just don't have any spiritual eyes you need to pray for that understanding it's there i mean satan is the prince of the power of the air and he is telling more of the story than the preachers in the churches today <laughs> i'm just telling you it's there so um we you know, live the, in fascinating it, times nobody, so it's it's not no doubt that these stories and these scriptures have dual meaning we had blinders on and we only saw them one way, but now we can actually open the scriptures and see that they they have meaning for our time as we sit here today. The only the only thing I would like to add is in Isaiah 11, verse 11. Wow, that 11, 11, that's the judgment, double judgment. Go ahead. All right, it says, and, and you'd have to go back to Daniel, the uh, seventh chapter, which is the 70 weeks prophecy to understand that Christ in some form or fashion, and I use that terminology because I think it's going to shock a bunch of people how this comes about, but it, he still has a, a half of a week, a three and a half year period of a ministry to the house of Israel. And I believe this second half of the week is being spoken of here 
in uh, Isaiah 11, verse 11, and it says, It shall come to pass in that day, this is after everything that we have just basically hit the highlights of has occurred, and this is the day of the Lord. This is the period of the birth of that child, the establishment of the government, and so on. After that period of time, it says, It shall come to pass in that day that the eternal Yahweh, Yeshua, if you will, because that's the very name that he has, will set his hand again the second time, the second half of that week-long ministry, of that seven-and-a-half-year period, which is three-and-a-half uh, days or years, to recover the remnant of his people who are left from these places of captivity, from Assyria. Remember the, the, the man who comes in, the king of Assyria, from Egypt. Remember the Moabites that come in? that are literally going to put us, take our goods and, and begin to swallow up like locusts our possessions from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and all of the islands or coastlands of the sea. Recover the remnant of these that as some education or education to the covenant and the government that is coming. And he will set up a banner for the nations and he will assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth, and also the envy of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off, and will no longer envy Judah, and Judah will no longer vex or harass Ephraim. And what we're seeing there are the two sticks of Ezekiel 37 being put together, no longer two-party system, no longer arguing between Republican and Democrat, no longer north and south, we will become one nation under God, the true God, in the true government, the house of Yahweh. So that's that's what I wanted to bring out. Okay, well, thank you so much, Joy. I think you brought out some really good points. And so we're going to just close for now, and we're going to say blessings to all and good night. 